Hello, all. Welcome to chapter number two of the webinar series, RoboMaker, where we explore with the innovators, the journey, the challenges, and the good practices for robotic companies. And today, if you're joining during a bank holiday or you took a break from work or your studies, stay with us. It's going to be a chapter really interesting, talking about how companies, robotic companies, raise seed and series A funding. And with us today, we have an amazing guest, uh, one of the pioneers and also top roboticists of our generation, Dr. Connor McGinn. Connor, really good to have you. How are you doing? Hi, Gabriel. Thank you. Thanks for the very generous introduction. But, but it's true, because if yeah. you look into your bio, you see uh, that Connor is the CEO of Akara, a robotics company based in Ireland that helps developing um, technology, robotics technology for the healthcare sector, based on more than 10 years of uh, research in uh, Trinity College, right? Yeah, yeah, you're dating me though. <laughs> it's been uh, a lot, quite a while. And as well, you have been uh, named one of MIT's uh, innovators under 35 by the, the Technology Review Journal. You are an amazing assistant professor as well there. You have a PhD in robotics. So yeah, really good to have you. It's always great to learn from you, especially through this journey that you have um, started. And like we were saying, this um, Second chapter is going to start talking about the challenges, the how-tos, the landscape, where to look for funding, and how to build trust among your investors when you're trying to raise seed funding. And with that, let's start with our first slide. And you can see one of your first tweets. Please, Connor, tell us a little bit more about that picture. <laughs> uh, I forgot I, I, I shared that tweet. So... <laughs> What you see here is 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 my office uh, or my old office in Trinity College, um, and among the in the background you see workshop tools and stuff where a lot of late night soldering would get done. Um, I have a hammock <laughs> as well, which is where I I, I would uh, I guess get some power naps in um, when I needed them. So yeah, there was many late night and early morning to place in that room. Always always useful. And why robotics? Why do you decide to, to, to start this journey? Uh, there's the kind of multifaceted, I suppose. Um, I think like most engineers, you know, beyond being interested in, in engineering and science, uh, I kind of was, was in, motivated to do something uh, where I could do good. And I saw in, in robotics, there was a huge opportunity to, um, you know, to improve people's lives and the quality of life. Um, the difference between a robot and a software program, of course, is a, a robot's physically embodied. And I felt that, you know, we, the kind of timing was really good because, you know, we're just at the start of, of robots coming into our lives. And I felt that, you know, coming out of an engineering degree, this was a really exciting area to go into. There'd be lots of opportunities. Um, I was partially right. I think the kind of rate of uh, robots being adopted and I guess becoming more ubiquitous is one of these things that's always hyped and seems to constantly yeah. fall under the expectation but nonetheless, nonetheless it, it's definitely something that we're seeing more and more of. And it's a really interesting journey so far, um, you know, to see where it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago and, and how it's come along since. And, and this is one of the, well, two of your first uh, reports that you got in newsletters as a, starting as assistant professor in the uni. First of all, note that you're basically having the same facial expression in both pictures, which is it is good that you understood how to take a good picture of you. I'm still trying to find out. I, I think I, I just get in front of the camera and I'm like a deer in headlights. It's it's the same face, whether it's good or bad. But yeah, like early on, I suppose what we were very much interested in was the apply, applied research side of things. Um, we saw a lot of a lot of very interesting things happening in isolation, but there's huge opportunity there to kind of take those developments um, and refine them and adapt them for real meaningful use cases. So you'll see in the picture on the left, we were working on anthropomorphic grippers, underactuated grippers. Um, we felt that you know the state of the art in grasping um, was an area where there was a lot of room for improvement and yep. you know, 3D printing technology uh, and a lot of tactile sensing was was, was a big part of our, our work. Um, and then on the right, you see uh, you know in the background there's a, a kind of a, a mobile service robot with a cursor for one of our robots, CV, which we might get to a bit later. Um, so we we're trying to understand how to kind of combine the modalities of navigation, perception, and uh, human-robot interaction. Um, and then the thing I'm holding is actually a pneumatically driven arm. So again, we're looking at different ways in which we could 
introduce compliance into robotics so that these robots could be could be safe. So I guess drawing together on all of those things, what we we're trying to do is find bottlenecks that were stopping, you know, full system level robots being deployed. And we felt that if we could overcome some of these bottlenecks and build kind of a framework, a sustainable kind of software framework for developing robots that you know, we'd have a platform that could yeah, be yeah. adaptable for the use cases we were most interested in. And you were always working, thinking about applications for the healthcare sector? Me personally, I was um, as, a, as, as a teenager. Um, I, I, like many people, experienced family members going um, to you know, assisted living and, and nursing homes when I felt they could have, with better access to technology, they could have remained independent for longer. So I, I kind of always felt that that was a, a key area where we should be trying to develop technology to, to, to support people. I think as I got older, um, I started to learn more about the burden of both professional and unprofessional caregivers um, and just how difficult it can be to provide support to others. So not only does this technology actually help, you know, the, the, the main person themselves uh, who might be experiencing some, some level of disability, um, but also the people who look after them, who are often under-resourced and, you know, huge labor shortage in that area. And during these early days, these early projects, how were you funding those early projects? <laughs> so I'd say... Um, about 20% of the parts on those, those those robots would have been procured from electronics recycling uh, dumpsters around the college. Um, the rest of it, we, we kind of beg, borrowed, and, and, and you know, I won't use the word steal, but <laughs> <laughs> we borrowed with no intention of returning. Um, so a lot of those parts were salvaged off, off, off various bits of kit. Uh, so we, we kind of learned a lot about how good design and bad design actually worked in those early days by stripping things and like you know our our lab whenever there was guests coming in was always a frantic you know yeah, rush yeah. to try and get things tidy because there yeah. was, was <laughs> stuff that we disassembled all over the place um so yeah that we we, we, we for probably three to four years we, we didn't actually have any dedicated funding for this uh we were in the middle of a big recession here in ireland and um, thankfully around 2017 or so we, we managed to get our first significant grant and i guess things moved from there and i can also see that in, in, the, in your laptop the sticker of ross what, what has been the role that open source has played for you? It's been a huge enabler. Again, with not having much funding, um, like if we were to go into any other sector of, of engineering, it's, like my background was mechanical engineering, where every piece of software we use would be proprietary. And it would, you know, it's not a few hundred euros, it's thousands of euros a year. So, you, you know, unless you're pirating the software, it's, 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 not, it's not feasible. Um, yeah. and, and even though we were dealing with hardware, that was our area of expertise. So, like, you know, we could come by those materials and we had access to tools. So that was never the issue for us. Um, so being able to get up and running on that, and you know, the nice thing about robotics is that the timing is so great. This, you know, the computer vision software is free. The, the robotic operating system is free. The, you know, the Ubuntu that it sits on is free, and these user communities are huge. So not only is it free, but there's help available whenever you need it um, across a, a global community. So people like myself, who would consider, I, I certainly consider myself self-taught. I, I certainly wouldn't have learned or been able to learn what I have if I didn't have access to those tools and those communities. That's that's true. I just want to mention for everybody here in the talk, if you want to ask questions, you can ask questions at the moment. We will address all the questions at the end of the session. So just keep sending them. And from there here, we move to, to the famous picture, to, to, <laughs> to this one. Um, and did you ever thought this could happen when you start back in those days? Yeah, I, we always thought it could. Um, we didn't know when and we didn't know the circumstances. And I think we were really surprised by just, you know, how it came about because it, it was extremely serendipitous. It wasn't something that's like we, we hadn't built up the level of hype needed to secure something like this. It, it yeah. happened almost in reverse. Um, we had a couple of robots being deployed both in Ireland and the US that were gaining traction amongst users. But, you know, we weren't certainly trying to market them. Um, and there was a couple of journalists who we, I think, bought into the vision of what we were trying to do because uh -huh. we're, we're trying to build these, these socially assistive robots to really improve and enhance the quality of life in senior living settings. Um, and our, our focus was certainly not on, you know, staff displacement or anything like that. So there was a couple of journalists that liked what we were doing and we invited them to come and see it in person. And we kind of felt that, you know, maybe we'd get an article <laughs> somewhere from it. We didn't know where or what. And, you know, we had a pretty open invitation um, to, to, to a few journalists. One of us took it up and so happened she worked at time. We thought it would be a small, you know, thing that sits somewhere in the middle of the online <laughs> edition. Um, but, you know, as, as, as time went on, you know, they were 
inviting a videographer in and a, a photographer in. And then and I won't forget the call where, you know, I got a call from the editor saying, you know, we're going to run with this on the cover, which was uh, a big surprise to, to both myself and the team. Well, I, I, I can imagine. And, and, and talking about these, these amazing robots that you have, please, could we get a, a small tour of, of, of your lab? Sure. So where we are now is, is in the Acara HQ. So this is based in the heart of Dublin 8, which is um, next to uh, the Guinness storehouse. So there's um, some very history to the area. I, I won't be unfortunately able to show you outside, but I can give you a quick whirlwind of, of what we have here. So I'm just going to grab my, my webcam. So, sorry. The end of it too far in. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to point it straight in front of me here. So um, the first thing I can do is kind of show you a couple of robots uh, nearby. So this is uh, a robot, our, our, one of our disinfection robots called Violet. It's one of our new versions. Um, the lights on the front of it there, which I won't turn on for safety reasons because I might risk getting exposed to UV radiation. Um, they shine a, a special type of light uh, that has wavelengths that when they interact with bacteria or fungus or virus will, will, will cause an inactivation, um, which is extremely effective. Uh, I have an older version of it next to me here, which is kind of being um, stripped down at the moment. Um, yep doing a few modifications to it and like many things you know what you see on the outside is is is, is kind of about a tenth of what's actually composed of so there's a ton of electronics we build it all ourselves in-house uh, which is great because it gives us full end-to-end -end control and we're talking to hospitals and different users and they all have you know somewhat bespoken different requirements um, or if we get a, a meaningful insight about something we have the means to make the change ourselves, which is which is great and like since we've been dealing with the supply chain shortage it's actually been hugely huge enabler for us because we haven't been dependent on companies making sub assemblies for us um so it's meant that we've been able to you know operate with minimum downtime and um, there's a kind of a an tent kind of enclosure that's a little bit further down it's a temporary structure we've built recently and um, this is to do some testing with our robot again we're using uv lights that can be um you know you need to make sure you're wearing the right kind of ppe if you're around them so because yeah. we're in an open office where we want to do a lot of testing we built this enclosure to make sure that anyone who's here is is given the necessary protection for sure for sure thank you for, for taking us to the tour and i think that we, sh we 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 have to crack on with the topic of the, the day that is kind of the difficult reality that robotics companies face i didn't, <laughs> didn't, want, to, didn't want to go to, to to go in the negatives but if you you check numbers if you see how much funding robotics companies raise compared to so far, companies AI ML driven ventures is only a percent of what they of what they raised in 2021. And with that is the question: You have been playing this game for 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 a long time. Um, why is it so difficult to raise funding for a robotics company to compare to any other venture? So I, I think this is something that we couldn't understand for quite a while, and we were. We felt that you know things like you know the Time magazine you, you, you pointed to to earlier. These would all be you know things that would have VCs knocking down the doors. But the unfortunate reality is that with, with an investor, like they're focused on returns and they're looking at things that can happen quickly. Uh, so if we're if we're successful, how fast can this move? And mm -hmm. they're also looking at you know things that they're comfortable with, things that they've invested in before, their friends have invested in, and they kind of understand what looks good and what looks bad. And unfortunately, because a you know there hasn't been you know i don't think there's any robotics companies that you can point to and say you know they're a runaway success there's no robotics company that you compare with facebook or twitter or you know google or any uh, microsoft or any of those guys so because that doesn't exist there's a there's a perception of risk i think the second factor is that it's related is that you know they've seen the hype train that goes with some of these companies that fall short and you know an example might be jibo uh, a few years ago they had some big claims and plans about how they were going to revolutionize home companion robotics again that you know ultimately failed before the product was even launched more or less um yeah. so you know they, they, they've, they've seen how a lot of money gets spent and gets burnt really quickly and then the third piece is the time like a, a lot of the time you know vcs will have or any kind of invest they'll have a time frame where they want the investment to come back and if you're looking at seeds or, or pre-seed level in particular where it's really just at a applied idea and you're dealing with potential regulatory hurdles and you're dealing with production and scale up and all of these other big unknowns it, you know the time frames are, are often not there so if you're not getting an investor really right in the sweet spot of where their fund is, you know, you're not going to be, you're not, you're going to, you're not going to be a fit for them. Um, and, and that's one of the big things that came back when, when we started to look for investments um, initially was that, you know, four out of five investors would tell us we're either not in their scope um, or, you know, the timing was wrong, whether we were too early or, you know, just they're looking for something a bit different 
and we wouldn't even in some cases we wouldn't even get a call it would just be you know looks interesting you know keep us posted but you know it's just yeah. it's just not fit for us yeah. um i think there's a probably also in europe which where we're based there's also you know definite weariness towards anything hardware related um <laughs> sometimes it doesn't matter what the you know for us we kind of say that like what we're doing we've actually been able to control our, our cost of sales and cost of goods to a point where you know we're able to produce robots we think between six and seven times cheaper than some of our competitors because we control so much of the production ourselves so mm -hmm. even like this perception that it costs a lot of money i i'd argue that the batch productions we're at like you know for raising a seed round of a million or so a relatively small part of that gets spent on actual capital production but again sometimes investors have ideas in their heads that you're not going to dissuade them on initially so you know it it, it, it can be, it can be tricky um one of the other things we found was that reaching out to investors that already have robotics companies in their portfolios seems like a good idea but they often feel like they're already kind of leveraged with risk because they have a robotics company in their portfolio so we found that actually reaching out to ones that didn't have a robotics company probably makes really good sense some of the time um which is kind of a, a strange paradox but it was working what do you mean what was working um going with investors that didn't have a robotic company in the portfolio yet well I, i'm more referring to what we're doing at the moment and um, so at the moment yeah i'd say on balance like of the companies we're reaching out to that have already invested in robotics companies you know many of them tell us that without pointing to particular portfolio companies they say that like you know things especially during covid like it's been hard to move as quickly as they would have hoped and um, the supply chain is really affecting them and they're just basically saying that like you know as far as we're concerned we have a robotics company in the portfolio we don't want anymore that's something that we've heard on a number of occasions um i think geography does make a difference as i've mentioned previously yeah, yeah. there are obviously some you know investors that specialize in, ha in hardware and they wouldn't fit into that category but they're in a minority i think the majority of investors we look to would be deep tech investors that would, would would invest across the spectrum of different technologies hardware would just make up a, maybe 15 to 20 percent of that component you, you also mentioned um some examples like jibo how many times an investor has come to you and tell you i'm i don't want this to become the next jibo or <laughs> do they do that um not not as explicitly i think you know when you're getting to a point where an investor is referring you to someone else and giving any kind of advice you're you're fairly far into a due diligence process in which case they've already they're already past the first hurdle of being interested in you yeah. and I, I think that you know before you get to that point they like you know very very often what they'll do is they'll say like look you know the people who, who invest in our funds like they know that they are investing in a med tech device so they know they're investing in software you know yeah. if, if it's a case where they identified what we were doing is something that fits that that portfolio then they'll say you know let's have a deeper conversation and they might get into things like that but okay. at the start like you know for example we've had a lot of people saying like we only invest in software like even though you know your your robot and a lot of the ip is is in software and the hardware component makes you ineligible for what we would be comfortable with and yeah. even though the robots you know differentiating and you know effectively gives you a monopoly it should be a huge competitive advantage it's just the way the fund was set up often that doesn't translate or again it's not a risk that they're willing to do a lot of investors as well that they, they'll like to think they're bringing something to the table and again if hardware is not within their wheelhouse or experience then they will feel that they won't be helpful as an investor and for that reason they might drop out so there's there's a there's a number of different reasons that they'll say no and like you know what we've been able to 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 do which was helpful was actually count and and, and tabulate all of the investors we've spoken to and why they're saying no and that's really helpful because then you know when you're going to look for grant funding for example europe has some really good grant programs that we've been able to to be successful with like we've been able to go to them with that data and say like hey the reason why we need this we really need this grant is because like we have these inflection points that we know we need to hit to become investable by these guys and the problem is we're a little early at the moment so you know if you can help us go from you know point a to point b like in six or eight months or 12 months whatever it is to the line you know we're going to be that much further down the tracks um you know it's also helpful because like again a lot of the investors we speak to they they, they see that you know there's huge potential here but there's a few points of validation we need to get like there's quite a few investors that will for example say that we only invest in companies that are generating revenue and a robotics company is really hard to generate revenue because like we're not like software where you can just put something yeah, in an app store 
and I'm simplifying things, but with hardware, you know, you're dealing with something that's, first of all, it's very hard to make many units of it. So something which in order for 10 or 20, it's not trivial to, to meet it. Um, second is that you're, you're dealing with um, potentially regulation, whether that's, you know, CE mark, it, you know, if it's, if it's in Europe, you have know, all kinds of European directives. If you're dealing with hardware yourself, like you're gonna have to show that you're complying with them. Going into hospitals, potentially you're in the medical device space. So, you know, to reach the point where you've got a, you've got a, you know, a commercially generating pro revenue generating product, it, you know, it could be several years. Yes, um, exactly. And you know, you also have situations where they say that like we're not looking for revenue, but we want you know um, customers to be able to validate what you're doing. Like you know, potentially you can put a robot in there, but you know, you need to have insurance then to do that. So even if you're, even if you have someone you're willing to give the robot to for free, like operationalizing it for a couple of months is, isn't trivial either. So there's all of these operational challenges that go with well, what we do when we build robots. And um, again, not, not all the time investors see that. And you know, many of them, I think are happy to like see the opportunity that's there, but they don't want to be the, the sucker that put the money in first. <laughs> and I think that the kind of, you know, the challenge to people raising money in the space is to, is to try and find, you yeah. know those, those investors that are willing to take the that leap that you get on well with personally um, and certainly in our case like you know people who add value beyond the money they give because it's possible that you know you're not going to get the valuation that you want at the earliest stage because there's just not going to be the same kind of hype in the round as there will be for for some other companies um you know doing web3 or, or any of those kind of areas that seem to be you know the hot topic at the moment it used to be ai and data science um but you know in robotics there's probably not going to be you know hundred investors trying to hand you money, especially not given where the market's gone. Um, so finding the right kind of investor who can be, in our case, able to, to, to close knowledge gaps and experience gaps because we're quite a young team. Um, yeah. like that's been a huge kind of net addition to us. And I think now we're going into raising our seed round. We're a much better place than we were a year ago because we have their guidance and mentorship and we've had it for the last year. So many of the, I guess, um, Many of the, the the parts of the foundation that you kind of need to have in place to, to yep. raise around, we've been working on that consistently now for, for a number of months. Right now, you just described perfectly the landscape and you throw a couple of great advices to people. And one of these is, is something that I found in, in your Twitter as well. Uh, an investor asking for feedback on when he said no, what he should do with the startup, what he, sh he should be telling. And you clearly put it there three interesting points that I believe everybody here, when, when they are um, looking for funding, eventually they will get a no. So they need to think about these things. Um, what is your take? When you ask these questions, do investors are capable of giving you that positive feedback that you actually need in order to execute? Well, I suppose like I, the, the, the points that I've raised here kind of are, are very much from my own personal experience. Um, and on my journey, there, there was a, a couple of big mistakes that I, I, I kind of I think I've learned a bit from, um, but for a long time I was oblivious of. So like when I was pitching, like I'm coming from academia, um, which is a very different landscape to you know entrepreneurship where mm -hmm. you're trying to make investment. Um, and I was doing things during interview or do, doing doing pitches that it just it's just not how you pitch a company. And um, like you know I must have had five or six pitches uh, before. I kind of one, one, one investor sent me an email saying like, here's the reasons why we're passing. And like a ton of the reasons they were passing was just stupid stuff I was bringing up that I shouldn't. Like, you know, again, with academia, you know, you talk about the limitations of your work, <laughs> you know, that was something I was bringing front and center to what we were doing. Um, I was like, you know, I was prompting reasons for them to, 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 to walk or to move away um, that, you know, I was creating problems where they didn't previously exist. And I didn't know what that was. Um, also, like we were, because we, I mentioned, you know, the issue of being too early is it's very easy for an investor to say this isn't for us because we're too early, and then you go, okay, grand, let's move on. But you know, if you if they tell if someone tells you too early, you know, an obvious question you should ask is like, well, what's not too early? Like, what are the milestones that I should focus on? Because yeah. you know that gives you two pieces of information. One, it gives you something that you can go back to them. Um, you know, you can go back and when you're raising your next round and say, yeah. you know, hey, you know. Remember we spoke and it's it, it, you know, the familiarity part's important. Like investors, it seems to me, they like investing in people they know. And if you look at companies that are, you know, entrepreneurs that have set up multiple companies, very often it's the same investors that have that invest in the, in the subsequent ones because, you know, there's a relationship there and there's a trust there. 
Um, yeah. And I think you know, being able to go back to an investor, even if you're not a fit currently, go back and keeping in touch, you know, it will increase your likelihood the next time. Yeah. Um, so knowing those milestones is good. And also for things like grants, as I've mentioned, um, it's really helpful to know what you should and shouldn't be focusing on. Um, and then finally, like what we found is that because we're outside of the scope of some of these funds, uh, and I, uh, coming from academia, didn't, ha didn't have a huge network, didn't have, you know, we're not based in Silicon Valley where, you know, there's investors and VCs in every corner. Like, you know, a lot of the time I'm reaching out to people like just by Twitter DMs or sending information to them. And that, that's not how, that's not the best way to get in touch with people. Um, so if, if it's a case where someone passes because they don't like what you're doing, then we'd never ask for an intro. But if someone generally does like what you're doing, but it's just not a fit for them or, you know, their fund isn't investing at the moment or there's some legitimate reason why they're not interested, then being able to get a, a qualified introduction is, is helpful or even just getting their opinion of who should I, who should I speak to, or who, should, who should I talk to? And sometimes it's not even the investors. Sometimes it's they'll, they'll point you to, you know, um, CEOs or co-founders of companies that are doing similar stuff to you that can be complimentary. And like, there's been a few occasions where, um, like we've built interesting collaborations with other startups because you know a VC has said you know hey you need to talk to these guys they've had a similar regulatory journey or, or whatever and you know you, you end up picking up an awful lot from them. And from that we move to what you were mentioning about the pitches. I know that you also said that maybe social media is not the place to, but you can look at this one that you did on 2017 when you were pitching about a TV. What, let's let's try this exercise. What, what what would you change now after, after so many years of experience? Um, like, I, I think one of the things that we've we've never done uh, has been like a, a properly coordinated marketing campaign that you know spans a couple of months. Like the video that you're about to show here, the video you're indicating here. This was just a, a promo when we, we built the robot, and we're like, how can we get this on people's radar? How can we you know, raise visibility on this. And, and this wasn't for ego. We weren't actually looking for funding at the time for this. This was just because we want to raise credibility amongst the people we're trying to trying to reach out yeah. to. Because yeah. if we want to get, you know, a hospital or in, in the case in, in 2017, it was nursing homes. Like if we want to get on their radar, we need to get into some of these publications. We need to be visible so that if they Google us, they'll see stuff. Um, so what we did then was we build a robot and we say, okay, well, we have two weeks or three weeks. How do we get the maximum amount of exposure? And then we do it and then we go back into the lab for another year or two till we build another one and then, you know, rinse and repeat. It was the same thing. Whereas I think now we're much more focused on, you know, months and years in terms of how do we actually share this story and how do we how do we, how do we go from there? So what we're doing at the moment or what, at least what we're trying to do at the moment is build, you know, a meaningful press and, and marketing strategy that, you know, involves everything from, Social media, we do day to day, mm -hmm. week to week, you know, sharing about how, you know, we're hiring interns and what they're working on and why they decided to join Acara and, you know, how users are using our technology to, you know, how ethics is important to us and how our values is important to us and the bigger picture stuff to, you know, new product launches. Like, how do we integrate this in a seamless strategy that goes across different platforms? And, um, you know, and no matter who you, like, effectively building a meaningful brand image no matter who you ask on the street you know what do you know about Acara yeah. you know they'll all say the same three or four things that's that's kind of where we're trying to go um it's definitely not an area where we've got a lot of experience in but thankfully you know we're, we're surrounding ourselves with people who you know that is their their area of expertise and hopefully over the over the summer um as we come out of stealth we will will um you know we'll, we'll be able to start acting on this good to know is it's important to to Keep that in mind, especially for young startups, the, the, the value of PR. But conscious of time, let's let's move on to one of the biggest questions that we have is, is where to look for robotics funding. As, as we mentioned, it is, is, there's a couple of sources, a couple of sources that are not adequate for robotics ventures. On your experience, Connor, where do you think is a good place to look? Um, I think it's, it's all based on geography, really. Um, if you're based in Europe and you know, if you're, based in, if you're based in Europe and you're still in the university, you haven't spun out yet, then, you know, there's many national and European grants that are available to, to do a lot of that. And, you know, we were in, in, in Trinity College for seven years before we spun out, um, mm -hmm. you know, fully. So, like, you know, we were able to raise probably close to a million euros um, to do that work. And frankly, 
we never would have been able to do kind of seven years of that kind of R and D. No one would have funded that. So you know, being in the university is a huge enabler, and I think getting good at right. If you're kind of someone's doing a PhD at the moment and they've never written a grant before, like you know, that it's it's just like learning to write a paper. There's a there's a skill. There's a, a journey involved. Um, you know, you, you submit it, you wait six six months, sometimes longer, to find if you're successful or not. Even if you are successful, there's normally you know, three to four months of admin before you get the money. And you can hire people. So, you know, it, factoring those kind of things is is is, is a challenge. So, grants, it, academic grants are great. Um, there's also grants for SMEs in Europe. Um, there is also in America, I understand too, but I'm much more familiar with the European system. Um, the there's effectively three big ones that we 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 kind of look at. The the first um is the european innovation council which is a very competitive fund they there's four periods a year where they they kind of um three to four periods a year where they actually shortlist people and, and go through this process um it took us two years to get one of these grants but like the opportunity and the doors that's opened up is huge we've been able to raise over two million with no dilution in the company which is very substantial there's some co-investment requirement uh, that we need to meet but you know it's just it's 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 been the biggest enabler that's happened to the company has been successful in, in winning that grant. Um, you know, it was a very detailed process. It involved three stages. It was something that we dedicated a huge amount of time and energy to, uh, but ultimately it led to, you know, a big opportunity for us. Um, obviously the European uh, Horizon 2020 grants where effectively you're working as a consortium. Um, normally it's an academic partner that will lead the consortium. So you're kind of one partner in six, the projects run for two to three years. They're great projects to be involved with, but, if that's your lifeblood, it's hard to see how you can achieve a critical path. Um, so we've been conscious that they have they haven't been the the main path we've tried to go down because you know we lose control over exactly what it is we're doing, and we didn't want that to ever be our primary source of funding. And then we've also been successful with these kind of micro grants that that come through um, again Horizon Twenty Twenty or Horizon Europe, and um, that for much smaller pots of money, it's normally about hundred grand, um, but you know. It'll be a standalone project for six or six months or so, where you can do you know a meaningful piece of work, often engage with a with a with a with a pilot partner, and they're commercially aligned. So, you know, if you set it up right, then it, it might lead to a sale afterwards. And usually, the decision making process is shorter, so you get a decision in sometimes it's in this six to eight weeks can be can be the turnaround time. So, you know, those things have been have been the lifeblood for us um, over the last, especially through COVID, when it was hard to raise investments. And um, now we're we're looking at raising um, a kind of a, a big seed round, which will likely involve an institutional investor. I should also mention that our pre-seed round was filled with angels, and um, so we were at the stage where you know we didn't have a market-ready product quite yet. We had some good traction with with users, but probably wasn't enough to, for for an institutional investor to come in. And um, so at the point we were at there, we had a huge amount to gain from angels. Um, they were able to open a lot of doors for us, both in healthcare, on fundraising, on a whole bunch of other things. So we, we brought angels into that round, and it was a really good decision for us now in hindsight. And um, we definitely compromised on valuation. Um, but you know, I view the people who, who joined that round as you know, effectively, you know, extensions to the co-founding team. So you know, I have no problem with giving up a bit more equity because we're getting a lot more in return. Those are the decisions that every company should have to take at any at one point in their history. So I think that it's also important to, to, to mention that it's not only the revenue that they are, sorry, the, the funding that they're bringing, it's also their expertise on the field. That Some people call it pedigree of, uh, of entrepreneurs. So th yeah. that's also something that they bring, especially for us, that we come from an academic uh, background. Yeah, well, like you know, a simple thing is that like you know, some of the, some of the names um, of, of our of our pre seed investors they're, they're very well known people in the investment industry. Like we've got three people who, all of which uh, have worked at partner level in in a top VC firm, or you know, in one case we've we've an angel who's invested who's first money into two unicorns. So when we get when when we get um you know evaluated at the moment from VCs, they'll look at who our current investors are and they'll see these names who they respect and. Yeah. Like you know, they, they can pick the phone up and give them a call and say, you know, what's what 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 are these guys about? And you know, hopefully they'll say nice things about us, given that they've invested. You know, also because they're quite well known in the field, um, like we're able to to ask them, say, hey, can you give us an introduction to these? You know, these guys, we think they could be a good fit. A situation that 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 they they know them, or they, even if they don't know them, they'll be they'll reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm a investor in this company. They want to talk to you you know will you have a call with them and then 
it, 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 you know, we, you get much more success doing that than you would if you were just cold emailing them on LinkedIn, which, you know, you could probably send 20 or 30 emails or messages to get one <laughs> back, you know? That's for sure. And one of the other questions that I have is what, what is the most, in your opinion, one of the most undervalued sources of funding that people just don't pay attention and it's a mistake because it could help them, like you were describing, target those needs from investors towards a bigger goal. So, sorry, Gabe, would you want to send that again? What What is one of those sources that has been undervalued that people do not think of and needs a lot of, you know, to keep for well, you? So I would say one of the, the it's, it's like, I think we tend to gravitate towards things that give us money. <laughs> so we look at like, what, like, how much money can we get from this grant? And while well, the money is critical, there's no question it's critical. Uh, in our case, hospitals have, are, key, are key user, key market, and they can be often very difficult to, to get in touch with or get traction with because, you know, there's lots of reasons. Like they tend to be slow to adopt technology because anywhere where the risk of a failure is high, and the, yep. the cost of a failure is high, they tend to be more conservative. So if they don't know you and there's no qualified introduction, it can be really hard to, to get through the right people. They're also complex from a, from a just a bureaucracy standpoint, especially in Europe, as you know. So EIT Health, which is a kind of a, a European-wide um, mm -hmm. consortium comprising hospitals, universities, and, and SMEs, is an amazing network. And we, we're part of one of their programs at the moment. And... They provide classes and seminars that we found really helpful from everything from investments to the kind of regulatory routes um, to how to approach hospitals and how to pitch to hospitals right the way you're actually making the introductions. Um, so we're midway through that, that accelerator at the moment, but we've been hugely impressed by the resources they've been able to offer. And like we haven't received any money from them, but like the value of the advice that we've gotten um, has probably saved us a ton of time. Um, and time is one of the <laughs> time and money are the two resources that we value most when we're building companies. And it was through that hard work that you just described that you were able to achieve this great success, getting one of the grant from the European Innovation Council. How did you feel when you got this? <laughs> A little bit like when we were on, we made the Time, uh, the Time magazine. Uh, it was, it was, it was, it was a huge relief. Um, like anyone unfamiliar with with the European Innovation Council Accelerator Program. Uh, it's a three-stage process. So there's an initial 10-page application and you submit, um, you know, in our case, it was probably close to a 100-page detailed cool. document. And then there's a, 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 a 15 or 20-minute interview that you do with people you've never met before over Zoom. And they are basically the the masters of your destiny, whether you're, whether you're successful or not. So, like, you know, we felt the interview went okay. It could have gone better, could have gone worse. But we were, we were just, they didn't give much away which way they went towards. So, we were definitely prepared for the worst. So when we got the good news, it was um, it was it was a very welcome surprise. I should mention with with the European and with the EIC piece, and um, like that was very much a team effort. Even though one or two of us within Acara were were um, responsible for drafting most of the, the application and video and so on, like we worked very closely with um, Enterprise Ireland here, which is our state investment agency. We also worked with an, an agency that helps you with grant writing, and they know that their their company will. Give them a shameless kind of promotion. They're a company called Lira. They're based in Dublin, but the, the co founder of it is, is an Italian guy. But like they know that grant system really, really well. They're clued in with what works and what doesn't. And like very often when you're writing grants, you know, you, 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 you think you're answering the question, but there's a question behind the question that you don't know. And we've been able to, we were able to tap their brains and get their feedback. And again, in the lead up to the, to the presentation, like they knew the kind of questions that come up during those interviews. and you know, if you're naively applying to this and you don't, you've never been true before, you know, you haven't got that intel. So, you know, because we work with groups like that, I think we had a big advantage over, over others that didn't, it meant we could prepare better. Um, so we followed advice and, you know, thankfully, I think the system that we, we tried to put around ourselves, that, you know, our success is a function of, of that working just as much as it is about us having a, a good idea. It's not only about hard work, it's also about getting that advice, otherwise you don't get in anywhere. That's true. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we talk about the team, and we we want to talk about how you build trust among those kind of applications and so on. Having your team, a team of pure academics, is that sometimes a, a barrier when you're investing? Sorry, um, when you're trying to get funding. 
Well, I think it was at the beginning, um, because when we started, it would have been 2019. And at that stage, we were all, you know, I was a professor and I'd no, well, I'd done a bit of, you know, university startup stuff, but not real yeah. world startup stuff. Um, so I probably aged about 10 years in the <laughs> in the last two years. But the rest of the team, like, you know, the, the, the founders we have, they all started working as as, as, as postgrads or, or in some cases undergrads. Um, and you know, we didn't have that outside experience, but like we've got that since. We've two years out of the university now through COVID, we've kind of become beaten and weathered and in some cases cynical. Um, we've brought in people who have backgrounds from working in startups and also multinationals. And we brought in investors and other mentors who kind of complement those skills gaps. Um, you know, so I think, I think it's become much less of an issue now. Um, and since we've been able to show the traction in the areas that we knew that we needed to focus on and we've been able to, to, to do that, um, you know, our ability to execute is being doubted less. I think certainly in the early stages, people won't question your ability to make the hardware that's, or make the, make the product. They will question your ability to operationalize it. They will question your ability to understand what the funding requirements are. They will question your ability to build commercial strategy. And I think commercial strategy is probably the most overlooked part of a robotics startup because, you know, you need to be able to show that it, it, this, it, it, anyone who invests in this, they know it's a high risk, high reward outcome. So if if you tell them that the market size is, you know, the total addressable market is, you know, 1.5 billion and realistically you're only going to get, you know, 2% of that market, then the juice won't be worth the squeeze for them. So, you know, you need to tell them that this market is a trillion dollar market uh, eventually and that, you know, you're uniquely positioned to, to, to be the kind of top player in it. And, you know, not only that, but like we have a meet, we have a strategy that'll get us there. Um, and you know, going from idea on day one, or you know, a couple of research papers that shows this it's not terrible. To that point is 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 hard. It takes a ton of rejection. It takes a ton of you know, come to Jesus moments where you know you spend a week preparing a pitch deck or a month preparing a t- pitch deck, only to, to realize that you know actually it's crap and I have to start over, and I'm already behind. But you still have to do it. It's like just relentless that kind of thing happening <laughs> um and just persisting through it those are the things that i guess just you know whether it's you know, whether it's stupidity or, or 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 just utter belief in what you're doing it's it's one of the two things um just having that yeah you know, trust in yourself and, and and your co-founders and the people around you that you know it'll eventually come right um and, you know it's like climbing a mountain you, you never look to the top just yeah. put one, fret, one step in front of the other and, and that's been what we've been trying to do and the other great thing that i see bakara constantly doing is running pilots going there engaging with what is going to be your final user what has been the role of running pilots for raising funding for your company uh, it, it, i think it gives you um a proof point that you can't control that indicates that you're doing a good job. Um, because I think when you deal with deep tech and you're dealing with like scientific papers and things like that, where you can give that to an investor and say, hey, look, here it works. Like they're not going to be able to give that the due diligence that it takes. Like they won't be, many of them won't have that kind of technical competence to do it. Even if they did, they won't have the time to do it. And, you know, even if they did further, how that translates in, into the real world, that's not going to be something that they're going to see. Obvi- you know, in most cases, they won't see the obvious transition. Whereas when you think of robots, what, you know, in particular robots, you're thinking, okay, how do they affect our lives? And showing it working in a lab, as we've seen from the Boston Dynamics, it's super cool, but like, you know, backflipping robots, but if it's so real, why aren't we seeing them every day yet? And what we want to do is show that actually the robots we're working on are real. Um, second piece is I think the labor unions side of things. Like if it's a case where you bring in robots, you know, there's a concern there that they're going to, you know, affect people negatively and, and, and do things that are either dangerous or going to cause harm or cause social damage by, you know, putting people out of work or, or things of that nature. So seeing that you can operate operationalize it in a way in which that's sustainable, I think is critically important too. Um, and then anyone who knows robots meaningfully knows the novelty effect is a big thing. So, you know, you could show this fancy, cool robot, but you know, you know, see where it is in four to six months. It's still solving the same problem or people got bored of it. And, like a lot of a lot of places will happily pilot a robot for you because like you know they'll be able to get nice publicity on the back of it they'll look like an innovative company but will they pay for it will they invest time and energy and their own staff into it 
will they weather the storm initially because it'll take a while to, to, to get it configured for that site? Like these are all open-ended questions that nobody really knows until you do them. So by focusing on those trials, by engaging very closely with those users, building out the SOP, the, the, the operating procedures, um, you know, having potentially testimonials of, of people who've used it and you know, seen their working conditions or the efficiency of their work improving as a direct result of it. Like these are extremely powerful and valuable proof points that an investor will look at. And if you're like us and you're constrained on how many of these robots you can produce, you're not producing you know, th units of thousands, it's, 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 it's either single digit units or, or, or double digit units, then like the power of, of the impact that you can do in those couple of use cases is really, really important. So that's been what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to, you know, find high value partners where, you know, it's a win-win. Like from our standpoint, we have an engaged early early adopter that will buy into the project well enough. And from their standpoint, they'll have a level of, of customer support that they've never seen before. Um, where you know, we put our staff permanently on those sites for as long as it takes for them to be happy. Like that's the kind of, that's what we do. And then when, when, when at the end of the day, we've met or surpassed their expectations, they're only too happy to talk about the experience. And then, you know, the investor goes, actually, these guys are real. They, they, they've thought about this. And anyone who's considering buying the technology, another, another hospital, another, another customer, they'll, you know, hopefully, you know, hear good, nice things about us from people they trust. And exactly. that will enable things. Because a lot of time people don't want to be the first customer. They want to, like, you know, nobody wants to be the first person to go into space. You know? But people don't mind being the thousandth person to go into space. And we, we appreciate that. And we really do a value. We, we really value the people who want to be the first to have our robots. And we put tons of time and effort and energy into them. And, you know, that's why we tweet about them. That's why we try and raise awareness because, you know, a lot of the time they're not getting, they're not going to get credit otherwise. Like they're, they're doing this and there's someone in that, there's so, one or two people in that organization who are innovative and are probably, you know, swimming up, upstream uh, yeah. to get these thing over the line. And we want to do all we can to raise awareness for what they're doing and support okay. them and that that's that strategy and that vision and they're we want to repay the faith they're putting in us that's true unfortunately we're running out of time but just want to finish with we, we talk about the struggle but you also have to remember to enjoy the journey do you remember this picture by the way i, I think it, it was already on black and white don't i i, <laughs> I, I, I do you I, I, one I'm embarrassed to say that I, that that shirt, even though you can't see it, I, I still have that shirt and uh, I still wear it regularly. So I probably need a, a new wardrobe. Uh. <laughs> but do you remember which award you won? What what are you holding there? Um, Better World is that is that right? Uh, I do have the answer somewhere here. It was a oh, stand up. <laughs> it's Smart World. Full last. Uh, smart World. I world was, was in there somewhere. But it was close. Um, <laughs> how Trinity helped you throughout this whole journey? Um, so, like, they, they, it's, they've been an amazing source of support throughout over the last decade. Like, as an undergrad, um, you know, they the professors there really excited my interest in, in engineering, and um, I found mentors that are still mm -hmm. mentors to this day. Um, people who were very happy to, you know, speak to me outside of subjects and, and advise me in, in, in important ways. Um, I did a PhD there, and again during my PhD, I, I kind of received support. I was, I was doing much more than just working for a PI. I got a lot of individual assistance and, and help, actually carving out what my career was, and um, that allowed me to go, subsequently, you know, build a research group at the university. Yep. And you know, whether it was within our department, within the school, um, or within the kind of the the administra administrative and technical function within the university, like there was just even though. Funding was limited. We had people that really got you know bought into what what I was trying to build and what we were trying to develop, and you know rolled in behind that. And of course, like the students that come through that university were top notch. And again, you know, we gave them an opportunity to get involved in research, and and they they joined and added huge value to what we were doing. And yep. if it wasn't for you know Trinity providing that that platform, like we wouldn't have been able to to to, to build the team. We wouldn't have been able to do the critical early stage research that allowed us to gain the experience necessary yeah. uh, to spin the company out and do what we're doing at the moment. And, you know, now is where we manage the process of being, what we call it a, a campus company, which is effectively a, a, 
a, a company that spins out from the research and the university have some you know involvement as as, as small state uh, shareholders like you know we're able to collaborate very meaningfully with them now so a lot of the work that we're doing in hospitals we're able to collaborate with colleagues different schools to to explore you know what's working and what needs to be improved on, on different parts so you know we've kind of gone from being almost like an incubator to now being a partner a collaborator um so it's really been fantastic and and we're just very grateful because we hear some bad stories from some other universities and i'm just thankful that um our experience has been very different from that and just to end before going to questions um this is one of your quotes that you did back in 2017 for the irish time just, just the last the last part i found it really interesting robots will give us utility that we badly need but they will also give us deep insight into who we are what have you learned about you during this journey? What robots have taught you? I think that, you know, it's seldom that we want robots to fully replace people. Um, you know, the applications might be, you know, the obvious ones would be things like a nuclear power plants, or if you wanted to go to space and do stuff up there where, you know, it's generally not feasible or practical to send people to Mars for months or years at a time. Like these are areas where, you know, the robot does everything. But most of the time what the robot's being do is used for is being brought in to complement what a person does. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's effectively a force multiplier. It's like, you know, it allows people to be more effective. And how, yeah, we, right. how we build these robots and integrate these robots into our workflows says a ton about, you know, the value that we have for, for the workers that they're helping, uh, how involved those workers are in shaping what it does and doesn't do. Like, you know, it really, it, it, it's, it's, it's effectively holding a mirror to us as a society to see what we value. Um, and one of the things that we're doing at the moment, or one of the things that really drives us at the moment is like, we're, we're, we're helping build tools for a part of the workforce that has been hugely overlooked and underappreciated. Like we're literally cleaning hospitals the same way now as we did during the Spanish flu pandemic. And like yeah. what happened during COVID, we were like, you know, didn't know how, how contaminated these rooms were, but we were sending people in mindlessly to clean them. Even we didn't know if the cleaning was working or not, but nonetheless, you know, these people, many of which, you know, might not have high school educations, they're being sent in as the frontline workers the, 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 to do this. And, you know, what we want to be able to do now is build, you know, a better, faster, data-driven, uh, responsible way to clean that not only leads to better performance and efficiency, but new opportunities for, for you know, a member of a workforce that hasn't had the opportunity to progress in organizations before. And we've seen this again and again in hospitals, uh, you know, every other position in the hospital, there's a, a career trajectory that, you know, you, you start on, on one rung of the ladder and by the end, you know, you're on rung 10. Like that doesn't happen for a lot of these um, kind of, you know, entry level roles that, that come in. And, you know, we think bringing in technology like this that has previously been reserved for the consultants, but putting it in the hands of the people who arguably need it more, um, you know, that speaks to that quote. 100%. Connor, thank you a lot. We have some questions here. I'm conscious of time. Let's, let's jump really quickly. How do you certify your product or demonstrate that they are compliant, for example, with CE marks and so on, um, when using open, so open source software like ROS? That's a very good question. Um, so CE marking is... A an interesting one. So there's a few different types of regulations that we would be particularly susceptible to. CE marking covers kind of device safety in Europe. And um, the next one I'd say is interesting would be medical device certification. And that would be applicable if we claim this to be a medical device, which would only come in really if we were disinfecting surgical probes or something that was itself a medical device. So we actually avoid that. Um, or at least we're currently avoiding that, uh, that requirement. And then the third is around regulation for UV exposure. Because we're um, we're emitting a type of radiation that can be harmful. There's certain regulations around that. So um, I'll start with the, that last piece because it's the easiest one to move through. Um, with the right kind, of, those kind of radiation limits apply only if the light is exposed to direct skin or eyes. So we have standard operating procedures that minimizes the likelihood of direct exposure, and where it does happen, we ensure that the levels are below the thresholds that are stated, and staff are wearing the right kind of PPE so that. It won't hit their eyes and their skin, and you know, we developed those. Um, we developed those SOPs, and we test them ourselves in, in detail, and we record data, and that gives us the, the means to go to the insurance companies and get the coverage we need to do that. Um, in terms of the CE marking, there's obviously things like you know 
radio uh, emissions and RF requirements there's certain types of things around static electricity um, this wouldn't be my kind of core area but uh, other kind of my, the CTO of the company for example is an expert in this stuff so we're working very closely with um, we work with a, an outsourced standards agency that have the means to do a lot of those testings to show that we're within the limits uh, the medical device directive is a, is a is a is a key thing that we need to do so you know detailed risk analysis on all of the kind of failure modes and what you need to be able to do to mitigate that what are your safety systems these are the kind of things we, we build in yeah back to your question around ROS and, and where those kind of software systems come in is that like there's different tiers of safety systems on, on a robot like ours and um, so what, what we've had to do is build a lot of the core functionality around safety is not it, it can't be the AI and the perceptual system because they're not recognized as that level of safety so we have for example it, it sounds kind of mundane but the you know, bump sensors that automatically disengage motors would be something that you need to have. Like when we're buying a LiDAR, it has to be a safety rated LiDAR. So again, the jacks, that's one of the things that jacks up our, our cost of materials is that certain components have to be safety rated, which usually, you know, it ticks a box from a risk perspective, but it's negative from a, from a, you know, a unit economics perspective. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, then, you know, we're obviously careful as well with what libraries we're using. So we have to look at yeah. whatever the open source licenses are for the libraries. So thankfully, up to this point, um, you know, we haven't had to use a library that's caused any, any real problems. There's one or two occasions where we did review and realize actually, you know, long term, this isn't a good idea for us. Um, but I'd say we're, we're still kind of navigating that process. We're still are, are even though we have a commercially ready product, you know, it's, it's still evolving. It's still ref being refined. Um, so it's kind of a journey and now as we move towards ROS2 and what's in, in, improving there, like, you know, we'll probably, we'll, I hope that we'll be able to use more and more software elements that are, you know, from the open source community because they'll have the level of robustness that they've needed. I know other companies in the space, um, many of them don't actually use that much ROS, even though they see a lot of value in it, they just, for a liability perspective um, or from a, a, you know, a licensing perspective, they, they have some issues with it, but you know, thankfully for us, you know, we, we, we extensively use it. One of the other, other questions that we have is how do you convince an investor that your product will be of great interest to the society? I think that sometimes we, we fall in love with the idea that this <laughs> one, and we think that we are going to be helping someone, but how do you actually re com transmit that to others? So it's it, you have to be able to elevate a pitch. If you don't, you don't, if you don't get that across in the next, it, you can't. If you can't in ten seconds or twenty seconds tell people why this is important, then you know you're in trouble. Like for me, you know, I'm able to say that like you know, there's at least twenty rooms in a hospital that takes two hours a day to clean, and in that two hours, you know, if you if you, if you could remove that two hours, there'd be like six procedures you could do, and if you're able to you know free up that space, then you know you'd be able to charge extra money for it or you, know, you can reduce the number of infections like you know <laughs> if you if you were able to reduce infections in hospitals by 20 percent um you know you'd be able to free up an extra you know 200 bed days a year in many cases so like these things all have value and you're able to like get their attention pretty pretty early on like you know one of the things that i'm saying at the moment is like based on the case study we're doing at the moment one of our robots is going to save a hospital nearly three million uh, euros so like you know if you're able to just get to a point like that pretty quickly um, and have the numbers, even if they're not fully threshed out, but that you have the, the investors listen to money. It's like, who's going to pay? Who's going to, who, whose pain is being addressed here? Who has the money to look after this? And, you know, after that, it's, it's straightforward. But if you can't get to, if it takes you 16 slides before that's clear, you've, you've lost. You have lost their attention. You have lost yeah. 100%. Um, Connor. I think that that's all the time that we have. Thank you again for being here. Thank you again for sharing those great advices. Basically, during the first 21st minutes of the presentation, we had like five, six great advices. We could have ended it there, but it was great to have you and go through this whole journey with you. Best of luck, Sanakara, and we look forward to see where your robots will land next. Pleasure, Gabriel. Thank you. I uh, really enjoyed doing this. Take care. Thank you all, and don't forget to join us for chapter number three. Have a good weekend. Bye.